welcome to Reproducibility, an open science podcast, usually featuring early career researchers. I'm Sarah. I'm currently coming to you from Padova, Italy, because I am at SIPS. And I am a visitor to these lands, actually, for the first time. And I say usually early career because today at SIPS, I have a very special guest. I am sitting with Zoltan DNS, who is one of the keynotes at SIPS. And when I saw that he was going to be at SIPS, I really wanted to have a chance to have a talk with him because I read Understanding Psychology as a Science several years ago, and it really changed how I understand statistics in the sense that I feel like I finally actually get it. <laughs> See if that's true or not. Um, but yeah, um, and we've been you know, talking about some of his work on the podcast. So we wanted to talk to him in more detail. So I'll invite you now to introduce yourself. Well, I'm Zoltan, as, as you said. Um, the name's Hungarian, incidentally, because my grandfather's Hungarian. I was okay. named after him. But I was, I was born in Australia, came to England when I, when I was 11. And I'm now a professor of psychology at the University of Sussex, where, where I've been working since 1990. So I've been there 33 years now. So yeah, but not quite an early career researcher yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I think you still could have something very valuable to share, obviously, with, with ECRs, which is why um, I thought it'd be cool cool to talk. Now, you gave a keynote yesterday, so I thought what we could do today is, could you give a Cliff's Notes, essentially, of your talk, and then we can go into a bit of discussion. Okay, we can give it a go. Um, so the, what I was uh, thinking about was the, the things that the actions I've done that uh, might improve uh, the way we do research, mm -hmm. um, mainly as a way of um, ha having the audience think about what, what actions could, could they do to improve mm -hmm. research. Um, I mean, there's so many things. Open science is so big, and there's, there's, there's certain things I haven't done. Um, but sort of one, one of the messages I want to get across is that um, uh, small changes, even little things, do make a difference in the end. Uh, and so uh, a lot of little changes add up, can add up to a lot. So I went through a set of eight actions that um, people might want to think about. And the, the, f the first one was thinking about um, how the publishing system is... Um, it's completely dysfunctional within within science. We talk about this a lot. You do talk about that a lot, so I don't. Yeah, yeah I don't need to summarise uh, quite how bad the bad situation is. Um, but it's very difficult for people, to say, not to publish with Elsevier or for profit yeah. companies uh, because of the career incentive um, structure mm -hmm. uh, that we have. Um, but but as a professor uh, with with a lifelong job. Um, I could make the decision, which I did two years ago, that I would not, I would not work for these people anymore. I would not do any work for for for, for a journal that's run by for profit, and that some of that money went back to an academic society. Because some academic societies depend for their existence on the money that comes from journals. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in those cases, it's not you know there, there's some mitigation to um, the evilness of of what's going on. Um, so I don't, as a bit over two years ago, um, review, edit, or author for any journal that's run by for profit, unless it's a society journal. And there's specific sense of money going back to the to the society. Mm -hmm. uh, and I made a public statement of that, so that there's no get out for me. It's just something I stick to. Yeah. Um, but I realised for an early career researcher, maybe that's not a decision. Uh, that that's a, that's a harder decision to make. And also one that might be more difficult for them because they're not in complete control of the process in any case. So you have your supervisor or your other sort of more senior authors who might feel they can tell you, you know, that their opinion might uh, uh, override yours. But there might be some smaller decisions one can make because any change in the right direction makes a difference. Hmm. Um, and what one I think uh, anyone could do is to decide not to review for any for-profit uh, journal, necessary society yeah. journal, because there's no harm to your career from not reviewing, yeah. or very little. 
Um, <clears throat> and then something else one can do. I mean, the reason why um, journals, say nature journals, have prestige is that they're cited a lot. Mm -hmm. But we're in control of who we cite. Yes. So I would say one action you could think about is don't cite something just because it's nature or, you know, some parent prestige journal. Yeah, we, I, I think quite a lot myself about citation. And we had yeah. a, an episode actually about citational politics oh, yeah. where yeah. we talked about, yeah, thinking about how we cite and why we cite mm. and potentially moving away from just that sort of perfunctory prove I have the knowledge I'm supposed to have right. and move more towards who have I read in depth, who have I engaged with yes. and looking for people who are more marginalized socially yes, exactly. to yeah. up the citations for them so that they get yeah. more benefit and we spread out because we could treat citation like you're saying as a form of power with yeah, exactly. currency yeah so we, we, we can shift the way we think about citation yeah yeah and that could include journals i've not thought very much about journals to be honest i'm more interested in so far like the identity of the authors yes um but yeah the journals are something i've i've not thought much about so far it's just sort of a where do i think this fits best in terms of topic well the two are probably going to be correlated aren't they mm. so the more um the higher the power of the author, probably the higher the prestige of the journal that they're in. So in, in following your rule, you might be almost uh, going halfway towards, right. uh, in some respects, the, uh, uh, the rule I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so when you, when there's sort of several equally good sources, I mean, the general point is, is, is realise you are wielding a power uh, when, when, you do, uh, when you do cite. Mm -hmm. um, and then related to that is now there are <coughs> several publishing models on the table which um, are experiments in how things should be for example well the one that I know most about because I'm heavily involved in this peer community and um, it was set up some years ago, mainly by biolog biologists, so they're sort of, uh, they don't call them journals, they call them communities. So that the communities, so we, each community is, if you like, a different journal. They, they tend to be biological, but um, just over two years ago, Karina Logan, Chris Chambers, and I set up the community in registered reports. So there was a, 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 a sort of an ethical registered reports outlet, open to any, any science. Or indeed, even uh, humanities, where registered report might be uh, mm -hmm. might be valuable. So, what what it costs us? Um, we have our own peer community and has its own platform. It's, it's been an open tab in my phone for months and months. I have not yet like really gotten into it, but it's a good right. reminder to like revisit that idea. Have a look at it. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. what it, what it costs us for each of these communities each year is three hundred euros to run. So, I mean, that's substantially less than almost any article processing charge yeah. for, for a single article, yeah. let alone a whole journal for a whole year. So the point is, I mean, we, we, we do the editing and the reviewing and all that work. Um, and that shows um, if we take for granted the labor of the academics, which already exists in the existing system, and then you pay for just what it, what it takes to support that. Then it's vastly less than the sums that the for, for we're doing the work anyway, right? So yeah, really it, yeah, exactly. We're doing the work anyway. So I mean, why do we do it just so the publishers can have jacuzzis and send their kids to private schools? Yeah, I mean, there was a figure at one point. I think someone cited like in the billions of dollars. This is how much volunteer labor we do. Yeah, in the academy. That yes. just figures like that. Just like are kind of enraging. <laughs> And, and, and yeah, seeing how much exploitation is really happening. Yes. In an otherwise quite privileged position. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bollage Axel did that. I think for um, he costed the amount of labour that goes into reviewing. Uh, yes. That's just reviewing. I mean, the loan of you know authoring and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and editoring. In the peer community in model, <clears throat> what happens is when we when we finally accepted a, a registered report, we have a set of now 30 journals. It went up to 30 during my keynote, incidentally. Uh, Simone, who was listening, then put Calabra onto mm -hmm. it. So we jumped from 29 to 30. So in my keynote, I said we had 29 <laughs> journals. Now I can say it's 30. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
Um, so so what, what 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 happens with these journals is once we've submit, uh, once we've accepted the paper, that those journals guarantee that they will accept without further mm -hmm. review, given you satisfy the remit of the journal, yeah. and you pay the APCs. Uh, but we in PCI decide if they satisfy the remit of the journal. That's, that even that aspect is out of the journal's journal's hands. So in that way, because it can eventually end up in uh, standard and some prestige journals like well, I count as prestige like Cortex. Um, Royal Society Open Science and our, our Calabra, um, then people do take us seriously in the sense we get a lot of submissions. So we've had, um, I think it was um, 70, uh, is it 69 stage ones uh, of the registered report, except fully accepted, uh, 22 stage twos, that's fully through in two years. Uh, and for registered reports, I mean that it takes a long time for a registered report to come come, yeah. come through because you have to uh, go through the process twice. Uh, and we're just getting so many more submissions. We have to um, we've been advertising for more for more editors, and the recommenders, and, and the recommenders have been coming. So the system's really working. Um, and then once uh, once we've acquired the prestige of the journals which we feed into. And why wouldn't we? In the sense, we've already got it because people are taking us seriously. Mm -hmm. At some point, people will realise there's no need for the journals. Hopefully, <laughs> in the unless they can add something. Yeah. So, for example, after my talk, um, the editor of Meta Psychology, um, Ricard Carlson, uh, pointed out to me that uh, Meta Psychology, the journal, which, which is also completely free, just run by academics, does uh, computational reproducibility checks. Um, so if you came through us and then decided the meta psychology where you go, you'd actually gain something. You gain a reproducibility check mm -hmm. uh, on, on on your analysis. So in that case, meta psychology does add genuinely adds um, some some rigor to mm -hmm. and and quality to to the to to the end product. I mean, if you went with you know the nature human behavior is on our interested list, which means they'll consider our articles but won't won't um, guarantee they'll accept us. Mm -hmm. What do you gain if you go if you go with them in terms of the quality of the of science if that were nothing? It's just a, it's, 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 it's just joining a rich person's club. Do that. Yeah. I think for the challenge for that for ECRs for students is the time it takes to do a registered report. Mm -hmm. like it, it, it takes longer and we have these like really, really tight deadlines. Or for me, it was you're, after three years, like you're done. Yeah, I yeah. I can't keep you again for years, so that's fair. Yeah. And I have, that was what I wanted to do anyway. Yeah. But it, I mean, I didn't know about this stuff at that point anyway. No. But now that I do, I still sort of worry that that wouldn't be enough time. And yeah. that, that can't be all of your studies, right? Because maybe one and the PhD can be a registered report. What yeah. happens to the others? and yeah. Like where's the where's the safety net for the ECRs, like well, you know for any kind of. So what I do with um, PhD students that I get is we get going at the very beginning of the first year with thinking about and planning and then implementing registered report. Mm -hmm. Probably they won't start collecting data on that until till the beginning of the second year, maybe even yeah. a bit later. Uh, but that's fine. At least they get one registered report out. And I think the process of going through doing a registered report does transform your view of what is quality science, because you've been through a process in which everything was tied, tied down and made rigorous. And it's it's hard to undo that in your mind when you look at. We talked to a student did yeah. her master's as a registered report, and so the right. timeline was really tight. A master's uh, is really now tight. that's the only way she can think about science. Yeah. And yeah, that's actually really good. Like, as, a, exactly. as someone who's a supervisor, as someone who's who's teaching now, I think that's an awesome thing. Is that that's sort of that's the baseline now. Yeah, for exactly. some people, if they start with that. So I think it's a good part of a PhD student's training mm -hmm. is to do one registered report, and then the others. I mean, it's not as if uh, any of us think everything should be a registered report. So yeah. um, it's just just good to have some some of your output that way, and to yeah. do them when you can, and then the rest uh, don't have to be. One of the things that struck me overall about all your actions is that they, for me, I think they fall into positivist science. Yeah, but I like, couldn't use that term, but no, I know what you mean by it. Uh, right, so yeah. it's all about 
prediction hypothesis testing theory, mm -hmm. like I said, big, big theory, but there are other ways of generating knowledge that don't work that way yeah. and are very contextualized specific. Yeah. And a lot of psychology does operate that way. Yeah. I, so, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. come to that. Let me yeah. just, I just want to say, just to, to turn to previous conversation, yeah. um, Gilad Feldman, who deals with Pig Museum a lot, um, so I talked to him after the, the, the keynote, uh, and he's, he submits a lot of articles to us, and he said they, um, a lot of them are even undergraduate theses, or else they're masters. And the reason why you can do that is in Peer Community and we have a, a scheduled track submission right. where you the author guarantees they'll 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 send in their submission by a certain date, say six weeks in advance. And they provide us beforehand just a, a brief description of, of the sort of thing it's about. We send out that description to reviewers and those reviewers guarantee they'll review within five days. Of the time window that's allotted so that dramatically speeds up the process mm -hmm. so he says he, even with undergraduate and masters one year master students he can get through the peer community the the register yeah. report process within the yeah. year you start with the over the summer with the students then yeah. it can totally be done if he yeah. does it i mean i wouldn't have yeah. bet on it but yeah. he's uh he, yeah he makes it work regularly um and, it's, and that is an innovation of peer community. And so peer, peer community and registered reports, not only is it sort of ethical in terms of free for readers and free for authors, uh, it's in many ways, many ways, a step above what happens in, in the journals. We're already leaving the journals behind in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what we're doing. And, and to get back... I think what I, what I worry about and some of the examples we had after your, your keynote like yesterday evening was... If we choose to divest as ECRs, where's the safety net? Like right now, it doesn't seem to exist that like, you know, if we don't publish there, someone else will, and then they might get those jobs. And where does that leave us? Right? Like there doesn't yeah. seem to be enough of a, of a catch, enough of a culture change yet yeah, yeah. for us all to be able to be like, yeah, I'll divest. Yeah. And like, personally, I've just gotten a job as a lecturer, so yeah. I feel like I can start to actually do these things more because I do have that privilege. Yes. But I've yes. just come from a postdoc where I wouldn't have considered it yeah. as seriously yeah. because it has consequences for the job market. Yes. Um, I've sort of stepped behind your questions. I just wanted to say something about the previous mm -hmm. one, uh, which was, say, qualitative methods. Um, we do do registered reports and qualitative methods. Sure. Uh, and so... Um, if positive, positivist means sort of quantitative method, uh, experimental testing of hypotheses, then we, we're not restricted to that. No. Um, so, uh, I mean, one, one of our, it might have been our very first registered report we got out at stage one, in other words, accepted before the data was collected, was a qualitative methods one. Um, I that the distinction goes beyond that. Okay. okay. Where constructivist refers to things like constructive knowledge, like community-based mm -hmm. research, like participatory action research, mm -hmm. where the theories are generated very much from the data mm -hmm. and it's really close to the data, close to the context, yeah. which felt to me in contrast to what you're saying about like how we need these big level theories, which this yeah. type of knowledge production, constructivism, doesn't really care about that yeah. as much. And those are just different ways of thinking about knowledge creation. Yes. And that these actions, not that that's bad, but I think, you know, I'm just saying it, it sounds like it's a particular type of knowledge production. And I think yeah. it's worth saying that explicitly, that we're talking to a subset of the discipline of psychology. Yes. I mean, I, I'm an experimental body. psychologist. So yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's, that's what, what I, you do. I, I, that, that's what For I do. Sure. That's how yeah. I think about things. Um, but, I, but I think, I mean, if you're talking about registered reports, um, you can still pre-register um, with the sort of knowledge construction cases. I mean, you can't. Pre you, you wouldn't pre-register or run a registered report in quite the same way. But the, but you can still be upfront about the sorts of issues you're going to address. Uh, and what quali uh, qualitative methods people have told me who haven't he hadn't, he hadn't done a registered report but pre-registers his qualitative methods is it helps remind him of exactly what his thinking processes were. Uh, at the beginning, because those processes can, can you know, mm. if they're constantly evolving through the process of 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 do, doing doing the study, yeah. it can be you could be rewriting your own memory almost of of where you started, yes. and so to have a record of what your thinking processes yeah. were uh, at at the beginning of it, 
I mean, it still fits in completely within the within the logic that you're working within non-positivistic. Um, it's just yeah. being open Those about exist. Right. The, 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 the reflexivity. Yeah, it's like the overall, right? Exactly. And it's writing in journals. And for me, it's making TikTok videos because I cannot write daily. I, I'm, I'm bad at that. Yeah. But I can make a video daily. And that's sort of my practice. And it's, it's okay. finding something. So, yeah. So, so that, 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 that in a way is a form of pre-registration. So it's not writing. It's, it's video. Is that right? Well, I'm not, I'm not pre-registering in the sense of like, this is the study I'm going to do. It's this is what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. today. Here's what came okay. up. Here's something for me to think about and like, oh, there's something interesting to do in a lab meeting maybe in the future. Because yeah. I'm essentially documenting what it's like to start a feminist music science lab. What does that look like when I'm thinking about yeah. what's the process? So it's useful for me to look back on, hopefully useful for other yes. people. But yeah, just to, to say that those practices exist, but I think there's just different values. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure that they can be completely mapped onto another or one should subsume the other. But I think it's okay that they're incommensurable. Yeah. That they're actually quite different. Yeah. yeah. And they don't need to be completely complementary. Yeah. But to acknowledge that those things are like are different and that this is address all of psychology. Yeah, no. I mean I mean I mean I mean as I say that stated at the beginning, I'm 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 only saying sort of the uh, the things that I do, in yeah. case they have some Absolutely resonance. Not, right? like, yeah, yeah, exactly. In case they have some resonance yeah. with someone else, exactly. and, and then, and I'm not expecting anyone to do exactly what I do, um, as, yeah. as I sort of gave yeah. the first example. Well, a good example is a good like signpost, I think, to, yeah. to help people. Yeah. Because people like, I think, a, a concrete list. You know, is we have all those issues. Oh, change things, but how? Yeah. yeah so sometimes it's, it's exactly. really, really helpful to have like, here's a thing that you yeah. can do tomorrow. Yeah. Here's exactly. a thing that you can do next year. Here's yeah. a thing that you can do, and like. We were talking about in another session, there was um, this idea of, right, the easy, medium, hard, and, like, to give people multiple levels of entry. Yes. And I think a lot of what you said sort of has those different levels yes. in them, which is yes. really handy. So um, some of the, the, the actions um, that I that, that sort of come out of that is, I mean, if you, if you do the, the right sort of research, is to, is to think of doing a registered report if you've never done that. So that's sort of just a simple... Uh, concrete action now, another thing i i urge people to do you tried it yeah it worked no the, the journal wanted pilot data and the piloting just wasn't working we tried five different things and we couldn't so we eventually just stopped yeah. but it is on my list to do yeah it actually yeah. took me a long while i was editing i've been editing register reports since 2013 but it took me a long while before i actually did one mm. because you have to have the right conditions um yeah. for me that meant having a phd student Yes. starting who wanted to do a registered report and yeah. we had something set up we could get going with immediately and so on so yeah, yeah. but it's just something to, to to bear in mind and another thing to bear in mind because what, what i'd really like people to do is um so we have this peer community in registered reports but we don't have peer community in uh, communities for a lot of the sort of the substantial psychology that i do so rather sort of selfishly i would like someone else to set up the um the same, exactly the same thing, but not just for registered reports, but for other article types and say, well, cognitive psychology, or my, my sort of research is uh, consciousness research, uh, but also uh, sort of met meta science research. So, if, so if there's a, I don't, I no longer have the, the sort of the um, spare capacity to to set that up myself, sort of doing the, the registered mm -hmm. reports one. So if there was a group of people who wanted to set up, go to the peer community and website, it tells you how to set up a, a new community in a different topic. I mean, it does does take a lot of work. Um, I was thinking about it for the yeah. music science field, because I, I think that that would be something that a lot of people would actually be. Which field? Music science. Music science, yeah. I think people yeah. would be really, really interested in that. Yeah. But it's it's finding those people who are willing to put in put in the time. I think it's possible. I have too many projects on the go right now, so that's going to be on the back burner. Yeah. <laughs> But it's something that, yeah, it's good to like plant that seed, I think. And okay. now I have that in mind. So something concrete that someone someone could do, say, say with music science, is is think about the, you know, some really good journals we could publish in music science and who the editors are there. Mm -hmm. And if you can, if you have any sort of personal connection or just feel able to communicate with those with those editors, if you could get them on board <laughs> and being part of the... Right, they could be like an outlet. But if they join the peer community sure. and community, yeah. then see what you've done then is um, 
you, you say you're guaranteeing the same editorial expertise as you get in the in the in the standard trap. So there's no academic argument against going to peer community in. But the other advantage you get is if you can then convince the editor to make their journal a friendly journal for your community, then then there's no reason at all, there's nothing to stop someone submitting to peer community in because they know that's the gateway to these yeah. journals that they want to get into. Actually, this is actually the open to that. Yeah, that's oh, fantastic. Do, those reports. They're right. The only, as far as I know, the only one still. Right. So I think they'd be quite friendly to. Well, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, because by having the editor on board, um, if it's the same editor, they, they can't, they're not losing editorial control, right? Because mm -hmm. they're making the same decisions in peer community and as in the main journal. And then once 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 that structure is put in place, hopefully that just continues. Uh, yeah. Uh, over sort of successive editors of the yeah. journal. Yeah. Oh right, great. <laughs> I actually just had a question come to mind. Um, as someone who has edited registered reports, <laughs> you can you can answer. Yeah. Because the way that my work is structured, I have undergraduates every year, mm -hmm. and they may be able to work on some of the projects that I have. Mm -hmm. Could I have a registered report where the data collection takes place over multiple years? Yeah, that is one model, in fact. Okay. Because um, like one student probably couldn't collect enough to, to be well powered. But yeah. multiple years in a row, I think that yeah. counts. Yeah. It's possible. It's just, is that acceptable to have like, hey, in five years, I'm going to submit the full paper? Or is that too long? Yeah. So uh, one model is that one year gets the stage one done. Mm. Then the next year does the stage two, in other words, actually runs the data and analyzes it. And then perhaps works on, or simultaneously works on the stage one, which will then be used for the next year. I mean, like the same study to collect data. Yeah, no, no, like, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. So, uh, but then, but then, then another model is you, you get your stage one done, and then you just, as you say, run over several years um, to get um, the data for stage two. Now, journals, uh, journals like to control authors. They say you have this deadline, you must meet it or else. But why? Why that deadline? Well, uh, nothing actually happened. Nothing, you, you, you just write. Yeah, it and, the first yeah. time I got those emails, I panicked. I was yeah. like, don't worry about it. No. <laughs> yeah. Just tell me about it. Yeah. But if you if you yeah, told to us, yeah. So so in fact, in the journal, it's not gonna it's not gonna matter. And the peer community, and we're more explicit about giving authors control. So if you said to us, I'll collect the data in five years because I need that to get successive years done, we'd we'd say fine. You know why not? Right. Um, so that would be no problem at all. Yeah. Cool. Well, I would get like undergrads then involved. Yes. And they wouldn't have to complete the whole process. No, not at all. But they would not. be aware of it, and they would know that they are part of, like a bigger project. And yes. I think that's kind of a nice thing to do for an undergraduate that does has a limited amount of time, might not go into academia, but then has that experience. Yes, exactly. Available. Yes, exactly. Like, sort of loose, not big science, but. Yeah, yeah, projects and like with these bigger concepts. Yeah, exactly. They 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 are conceptually they are part of the bigger bigger team. Okay. It's just uh, spread over time. Okay. Yeah, no, that's right. So then um, the other thing the the other things that I that I think about is um, theory testing a lot, which, which I mentioned. So within quantitative psychology, you often get people do hypothesis tests. It's on the face of it, the testing theories. Mm -hmm. um, but often it's just, it's more exploratory. Yeah, uh, different from zero, yes, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. E exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's more like, I wonder if these variables correlate or if this has an effect on that. You know, I'm just wondering about it, really. And you yeah. test a bunch of things. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being exploratory. In fact, that Cortex, so Cortex in 2013 set up registered reports. Uh, and then some people said that, it's not that everything should be a registered report. Uh, how, how can you do this? We said, well, we never said everything should be a registered report, and, or that all, all science is um, of this sort of confirmatory nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of ways, ways of contributing to the process. So to, to make that explicit, we set up exploratory reports as well, uh, where the whole idea of an exploratory report is that you are having a poke around, um, and um, the goal of the paper 
is that at the end of it, you have some interesting theories that you think might be true as a result of hanging the poker around, and, and, and that's all the paper is about. Um, so Rob, Rob McIntosh, who was also one of our registered reports editors at, at Quartet, uh, ran that, and I think I think still does run that. The idea didn't, the idea didn't sort of take off in the same way as registered reports, because I think psychologists are already sort of doing that to some extent. Mm-hmm. But but my issue is in a lot of fields it that's all people are doing, uh, and then they're not they're they're sort of um, for each of these exploratory papers well they're often not framed as exploratory even though they are they're, yeah. they're sort of presenting themselves as as, as testing testing theories yeah uh, but that's one issue but even even if that wasn't wasn't an issue. Um, science would progress faster if these theories that appear in these papers were genuinely actually tested. So I think we're already in a position where we have a lot of theories that should be tested but never actually quite get tested. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I what what I do when I um, thinking about running a study is I think um, what's the sort of most general, interesting, bold claim that is being tested by this study. Uh, it might not be terribly general or terribly bold, but, there might, but there's going to be something that's tested, and there's a range. There's going to be a range of things that are actually tested. So why not pick and think about what's the most interesting general claim that is being tested? Mm. And um, but however far you go along that path of making your claim as general uh, as as possible, if you're in the business of doing hypothesis tests, you're in the business of testing something, clearly. Um, I'd like to make that interesting. So that's one thing for people to think about. But the other thing is is to think about, are they actually testing that hypothesis when they claim that they're testing it? Now, you'd only be testing it if you could find that it, out that it was, it was wrong, if you get evidence counting against it. If you could never get evidence counting against it, you're not actually testing it. Um, but most people, in the vast majority of cases, when people do hypothesis testing, which I mean most generally significance testing, um, mm-hmm. a- and other things, but including significance testing, um, they're not in a position where they could get evidence against the hypotheses that they're putting forth. And and the reason why they're, they're not, they think they are, but they're not, and, and and the reason why they're not is they can't they can't get evidence, they're not in position to justify the claim that there was no effect going on there. Mm-hmm. The reason why they're not in that position is they're just saying it's significant or non-significant. The non-significant by itself, the claim of non-significance has no evidential value. Yeah, sort of adding equivalence testing. After. Yeah. If I get a significant result, then I'll also equivalence test to. Yeah. So yeah, there's. Um... Sometimes they're unspecified. Hmm. Sometimes they're unspecified. Right. <laughs> so underpowered. Underpowered. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, one way of justifying the claim you have no effect is a calculate power beforehand, or b do equivalence testing or the Bayesian versions of that. Uh, or base factors, mm-hmm. the, the three basic ones. Yeah. So in my case, I, I did a power analysis based on a piloting, yeah. which is how I came up with sample size. Yeah. But then the actual participants were so different from the pilot yeah. that it was super underpowered. And I went, I did everything, quote unquote, correctly, yeah. and it still didn't work, which doesn't mean I won't do it again. No. But it just sort of, to me, I think illustrates that it's not, there's no silver bullet. Well, I think, uh, can, I, can I say something else there that illustrates? Yeah. Is there's a difference between power on the one hand mm-hmm. and um, equivalence testing or the Bayesian equivalent and base factors on the other, in that the other two make you make better use of the actual data that you have once you've got it in. Yeah. Power, power doesn't do that. So you, you, you said in your case... Well, the equivalence test was... Uh, is it unequivocal? Um, I think it's, it's clear... Yeah, so your your confidence interval included both uh, values within the equivalence region or the null region and, and values outside of that. So what that means is uh, is your data are consistent both with the theory being right and the theory being wrong, so you suspend judgment. Exactly. Um, you don't conclude anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
But now, if you just relied on your power, if you just calculated power in advance for um, an appropriate effect size, and then you got significance and non-significance, you wouldn't be in that position, would you? Of, of saying, uh, actually, the data are inconclusive. You, you don't have the three-way option of saying the data support uh, uh, the, the, the null region hypothesis, the data support yeah, the reason effect, that. yeah, or, or, or the data don't distinguish them. So, so that because power doesn't use the data once it's in, 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 in the best sense. So I personally don't like hypothesis testing with power as the sole means of doing things. Right. Now there is there is a there is a way of dealing with that, which you just mentioned, is, is you do do your power and then your significance test. Uh, but then under certain conditions, you might do an equivalence test. The trouble is you're using in that case you're using sort of two different inf inferential procedures, and you can sort of there can be uh, sort of inconsistencies and in possible conclusions. So what, what's better to do is just stick to, say, equivalence testing. Or what I prefer to, to, to call it is inference by intervals, mm. um, which includes Bayesian, but there's also a more general inferential procedure where you say, if my confidence or credibility interval is in the, the null region, the equivalence region, uh, then the data support my H, H naught, the interval H naught. Mm. Uh, if the, if the um, confidence or credibility interval is completely outside of it, then there is an effect. And as you're saying, um, if it includes both both regions, then you suspend judgment. That's a complete, completely sort of consistent inferential procedure you can use. But if you used your one, you could get a significant result where the effect was within the equivalence region. Mm -hmm. So there's an inconsistency there in in in, in what counts as a uh, you know, a, a, a difference you care about. Yeah. Um, so I, I prefer. So your your two step procedure is is one I I would advise advise not doing. Okay. So anyway, the the action there was um, when you do hypothesis testing. First of all, for power and equivalence testing, you have to justify the the the, the effect, the smallest effect of interest. And you use that for power and for equivalence testing. But you can only justify that uh, for a given scientific context. Because there is, there's no such thing as a general smallest effect size of interest in any context. Because how, how big something is before it's interesting, well, that just depends on the scientific question. If, you know, if you're doing quantum physics or cosmology, the size, the relevant size is completely different if you're interested in ants or rhinos, uh, you need, um, you know, yeah, it's, context d d d d it's context specific, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a scientific question. Mm -hmm. And people mistake the scientific question for a statistical question. So they say, I'm using a, my, my minimal effect of interest or the power or the effect I'm going to calculate power with respect to is a Cohen's D of 0.2, because some statistician so, said so. But no statistician can tell you what's scientifically interesting. So there's a stats lesson for all of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But maybe to backtrack for a second about the, the theory testing, I feel like maybe one of the only theories I've come across that seems to be really systematically tested is predictive coding. Maybe because it's newer. I, I don't know what it is, but it, it yeah. does seem like that one is actually one that people are taking going, okay, here's a theory. What are the predictions that can be made? Let's test them hmm. really rigorously. But given it's such an all-encompassing theory, it is difficult to test all of the things. Yeah. Now, predictive coding, uh, I'm not sure predictive coding per se has been tested, but th there's an interesting distinction. Right. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. It's, it's how, how do we yeah. conceptualize it in the ways that we can actually measure it? So, uh, I mean, I like Lakatos's like. way of looking at it. Something our like predictive coding, I think, of, is what he called a hard core, which is not, you're not trying to really test that. Uh, it's, it's really a way of generating theories in particular contexts, and then what you test in a study is is one of those particularly generated theories. Yes. And if, if that theory fails, you'd still be a predictive coding person. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, that was sort of, my PhD was parts of predictive coding. Okay. It was an interesting defense because one of my examiners came in and said, okay, I don't think this is a fit. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk. Yeah. And so it just ended up being a discussion about, about theory and how do we know what's, what's true or not? Because mm -hmm. how, can you, how can you test this? Yeah, yeah. You can't do it, but it was actually a really fun, fun events. I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I mean, in my own area, I um, one of my first registered reports was um, 
with a PhD student, Vincent Palpy, um, where I took my theory of hypnosis and thought, how could I really show that was wrong? I presented it in 2007, but I and, and then used it to um, as motivation for a number of studies. But I wanted to, to be able to directly test it, so we, I came up with this with this procedure and a reviewer in the registered report said it is obvious your theory is going to fail this is no point running the study so i so uh and, and i actually sort of accepted that i thought yeah it probably will fail and i was already busy thinking about what the new theory would have to look like mm -hmm. but then when we did the registered report to pass the test so that meant a lot more to me uh um in terms of you know that uh, support for the theory because it, it, it was a genuine attempt to to get evidence against it. Uh, ex at least one expert thought it would probably fail, but it passed. So then that says a lot. Mm. Okay. So um, within my field, I, I, I fairly constantly am testing theories. So when people tell me, which people do now and again, that they, uh, that they don't have theories in their area, they can't test theories, I, I'm, I'm actually, to be honest, slightly baffled. Because whenever someone does present, I say, well, tell me about your study. And then I say, and all I'm thinking about really is what's the what's the most general interesting claim I can think of that could be tested. And uh, often, at least, there is one. So I say, well, we can test that. So I think there are theories within psychology. I think psychology is ready oh, yeah, for theory yeah. testing. I mean, so the ones that I think are most relevant for me are statistical learning mm -hmm. and the learning stuff that I do. And then on the music and aging side, it's uh, the inhibition theory of aging is one that I think is one of the most maybe descriptive ones that has these these testing procedures that mm. are being there. Those are yeah. the ones that I come across, I use the, the most. Yes. Mm -hmm. there, there is good, really good work in theory building in our field, right. which is really quite exciting, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah it's like yeah. groove and rhythm and um, the evolutionary origins of music and like why we have music. And there's a lot of work yeah. In building theory. Yeah. 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 Anyways, to just bearing away of time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, another action, uh, just, just really quickly, the concept's really easy to state. Um, I had funded a reproducibility statistician at Sussex, so that um, any, any researcher within psychology, when they're about to submit a paper, can give the paper to, to her. And she'll go through the results section and the link to the publicly available data and attempt to reproduce all the statistics, tables and figures within the paper. And if she can't do it, she gets back to the authors and they go to and to and fro uh, until they, um, um, she can reproduce what they perhaps can revise mm -hmm. for now, now claim. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that then, I'm, I mean, when people have checked the reproducibility of studies within psychology, it turns out to be shockingly low. By reproducibility, I mean you're able to use the it's same data. Yeah. yeah, computational reproducibility. So that will at least. So the, what the attempt is, at least the scientific the claims in the scientific record are factual insofar as they say we got these results. The which is, right. Yeah, um, which seems to be a minimal requirement for our scientific field, really, that we fall short of that. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's almost self-evident that that, um, that reproducibility checking and, and certifying would be a huge step forward for psychology. And, and therefore, it's, it's sort of an easy sell to tell to your university or your dean, so just tell your dean you want one of those. Um, and, uh, I would hope so. I mean, we've talked about how nice it would be to have more specialists working in science and departments, mm, like yeah. method specialists and stats specialists and like someone who does the purely the computational reproducibility or, you know, to have all these positions, yeah. not only to increase jobs <laughs> on, on this job market that is incredibly competitive, um, but also to reduce load on researchers. Like we talked actually one of the most pre most um, recent episodes about workload creep and mm. the, the amount of work they're expected yeah. to do. We have to do like five jobs in one. Yeah. But if we can farm out some of that stuff, that's a terrible way of phrasing that. If, if we can get support yeah. from other people who have those skills as a specialty, yeah. yeah, then we have more pathways into science. We have better support 
and we could probably produce better quality work. Yeah. I mean, Rennie says that she really likes this job and would prefer this work than being an academic. So it, it opens up other career pathways for e e e ECRs that they might actually prefer. Yes. Uh, prefer doing. Yeah. We've talked about having the process of computational representability as part of the review process. So instead yeah. of necessarily sharing everything online, because like if I'm reading a paper, the data is open, I'm not going to take the time to go and double check the numbers are right. Yeah, but also you want someone independent to do it. Yeah. yeah. You really want someone so independent to do it. If it's absorbed into the work of the reviewers, now we have to adjust the workloading for that. Yeah, reviewers will never do it. Yeah. That. And journals have not And if I have access to the data, I will try. Yeah. I mean, it's a bloody hard job. And one thing that's good to do before submission stage is, is it's easy to go back and forth very quickly to, to, right. to, to correct yeah, things. Yeah, this is where we put this work. We all agree yeah. this work is important, I think, but it's, it's where do we find, yeah. what space in the workflow do we find to put this kind of work? Yeah. Um, journals simply haven't stepped up to the mark to do this, despite all the money that they get. <laughs> right? so. Like, do we expect them to? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, Meta Psychology does, which is completely non for profit, so right. that, that's great. Yeah. The American Journal for Political Science does. Okay. And there's one other statistics wily journal that does, but that's it as far as, 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 far as I know. So we, 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 we can't expect the journals to do this basically, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we could get our institutions to do it. And the reason why I think a dean might well approve of this is that if you can say in your pa in your submitted paper the um, the results in this paper have been certified as computationally reproducible by an independent statistician, you probably get past the triage stage more quickly in higher prestige journals. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's why I can suit the author and the dean for, for yeah. purely career careerist yeah. reasons. Uh, we'll be yeah. British context and Again, what you talked about the ref yesterday, and I think that that's definitely a selling point for the UK context. Yes, exactly. If, it, if, it, if in their environment statement, uh, the university says we, we have reproducibility statisticians, that's going to really help in the next breath. Like, I've not done enough yet, but I'm always assuming Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. A couple of years, and I, I, I'm expecting to be part of it, which is, you know, makes sense. That's why I was hired. Yeah. In, in part. Uh, then the, um, the final thing I talked about really was making university governance. The way we run and make decisions within universities as a whole, more consistent with the way decisions are made within science, or ideally should be made within science, which is a democratic process where everyone has a voice. We talked about this in your episodes. We actually used the paper and stuff. Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think there's a sort of easy sell. Well, what I found an easy sell, you can, you can say it very simply. Um, I mean, the argument is a bit larger than this, that why not set up a citizen's assembly to make some institutional decision? Yeah. Now, what, what senior management will gain out of that is getting goodwill from the, from, from the university staff. Currently, they don't have goodwill, mostly. Well, um, they don't have dispute, so no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so the, the, first, you know, the first VC who, who actually who set up a citizens' assembly type body to make some major decision for the institution, I think would, they would go down as a person who, who changed the quality of, yeah. of governance within uh, universities. Um, yeah, so I mean, my institution's not motto, their, their big thing is one community. So I think, I, I feel like I could probably go to some of my senior management and say, listen, yeah, <laughs> I think this could be a really good way to actually implement Why this you value. Yeah, yeah basically. there are other ways that they do some things, but I think this would be actually really in alignment yes. with that. And hopefully they would be keen. Exactly. If that, if that is, be, we'll see, but I, I, yeah. I do think they might be. If that is the motto, then th this is perfect. Exactly. If they mean yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So I'll we'll take that to them eventually. <laughs> um, the, the final thing I just mentioned was a paper by the Flourishing Science Think Tank, which is what are the set of um, sort of values that underpin science. And um, the paper argues that. Um, if you take the values by which any group of individuals can flourish, which are the values of kindness, um, compassion, um, joy in other people's joy, and impartiality, equanimity, um, if you suitably extend them into the domain of how knowledge is constructed or grows, you sort of get the same values. You can get, get, get the same values. So um, collegiality, working together as a group, you have to do that in science. Mm -hmm. 
this is the scientists it's all about that yeah, um, it's all about the star scientists it's, it's, it's all collaborative yeah exactly yeah. science doesn't grow because of one person no. um, you know it, it's it's teamwork um, another scientist's problem is uh, you know, part of science is solving other people's problems. That's sort of the, the, the compassion uh, mm. uh, uh, equivalent to it. And another science of success is something you can build on. So, because that's how science science progresses. And, and the fundamental principle of science is impartiality, um, equanimity, which is what open science is about. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm on board with that. Yeah. To me, everything has a position. You, there's always a value attached. There's always a politics there's no such thing as neutrality okay. I'm not sure but if you take that position to the extreme then there's nothing wrong with p-hacking but there is something wrong with p-hacking so uh, no, that's the same thing um so in other words in, impartiality to me in because you can have good politics and bad politics it is like who decides and there's like that's more of a, yeah, okay. a community thing but there's always a politic at play. Yeah, and so, so I'm not denying that. Politic. Yeah, so 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 in that sense, I'm not denying that because if you say there's always a politics, so then um, or a value attached. Or, or yeah, so I'm, I'm not saying there's no values, um, but the values include the values of impartiality in the sense when we um, as scientists consider some data and what follows from the data, then um, there's a fact of the matter that's independent of the desires or wishes um, of any particular scientist. So, I, think I think we can demonstrate that that's not always true. Different well, people can look at the same data and come up with different things. And different, well, you, know, you, can, you can ask different questions and generate the data. So every step of the way, what question you asked, what data you chose to generate, mm -hmm. what analysis you chose to do, all of those are, are not impartial. They're choices that you've made. Yeah, the choices. So, so I think there might be. Uh, uh, it was misunderstanding. What, <laughs> yeah, so we just have to make sure we're not sort of talking at yeah, yeah. At, at, at sort of cross purposes. Yeah. So um, there are facts of the matter about uh, what follows from the data, which is why there's things like multiverse analysis or uh, pre-registered analyses. So one has a sense, I mean, the facts of the matter might not be, um, only have a certain degree of precision about them, but, but they exist. Because if they didn't exist at all, you could conclude, conclude what you wanted. But you can't conclude what you wanted, because that's not science. So science involves um, regarding uh, theories, their predictions, data and evidence. The sense in which they have an existence separate from you is you can be wrong about them. So what you believe are the predictions of the theory doesn't mean they're the predictions of the theory. They have to be discovered, just as the evidential consequences of the data have to be discovered as well. Mm. So when I mean, I mean, if you didn't believe that, then registered reports have no value. So open science. The reason I'm why I'm convinced, but sure, <laughs> we're coming to the end, so okay, <laughs> we're okay. like, yeah, we're just, in, yeah, I mean, it's just time. Um, like, can we have that for okay, leave that yeah. for the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so so much, uh, for chatting and for sharing all of your actions, um, with our listeners. Uh, if anyone wants to find you online or yeah. find out more about what you do, how can they best find you? Just google my name and they'll find me. And um, are you reasonable through social media or is it more email? Yeah, email. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't do Twitter. Uh, I don't think it sort of encourages reflective, um, sort of critical argument, mm. the discussion of arguments per se. It encourages knee jerk emotional reactions. So I, okay. so I don't, I, I don't. Examples of like really, really great communities, but you yeah, have to yeah, it can happen. It can happen. You yeah. Have to really keep but but, but, but the, the media format doesn't encourage it. In no. fact, it's been engineered to encourage the opposite. Hard. You have to try very hard. Exactly. Yes. You have to work against the engine. Yeah. You know what's been engineered into the media yeah. principle. So, so so yeah, but uh, yeah, e e email is, so, is the best way. Yeah. Okay. So you can find me on Twitter at Sarah underscore Sove or on TikTok at Madame YYT. It's M-A-D-O-M-Y-Y-T. And you can always follow Reproducibility at Reproducibility on Twitter and find us on any podcatcher. 
Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye.